Okay, we're officially at 8.30 p.m. My name's Ron, I'm an alcoholic. Welcome to the Conscious Contact Speaking Group of Doylestown. Uh, a couple announcements really quick. Our anniversary is next month, 42719. It'll be held in this room. We put an all-day mini convention on. It's absolutely free with a free lunch. It'll kick off here at 9 a.m. You'll have seven different speakers from all over the country coming to do a presentation in all, diff all the different steps. Uh, it's absolutely free. It's pretty cool. And then our nighttime, we have Scott T. out in New York coming to speak. If you've never heard him live, you, it's not something to miss. But, um, that's important. In this room on Monday nights is an Al-Anon ACOA uh, meeting every Monday at 7.30 p.m. Their anniversary is April 1st in this room. So if you, if they have an AA speaker and an Al-Anon speaker there, and they have some of the greatest food. And they really don't eat it. So they need some alcoholics to come over and eat that stuff. It's pretty good. What else we got to announce? Be, please be mindful of this church. Be, keep it as clean as you can. We, we have a big, big crowd here, and it's very, it leaves a big footprint. So be mindful of your own uh, footprint, please. Like, watch the coffee cups and absolutely no smoking on church property. If there's something else I got to announce, I'll think of it later. Nick's going to come up here and relax. Thanks, Good evening, everybody. My name's Nick. I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> Welcome to the Conscious Contact Speaker Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. This is a one-hour speaker meeting that meets every Saturday night at St. Paul's Lutheran Church, 301 North Main Street in Doylestown, Pennsylvania. The business meeting for this group meets every Saturday night at 7 p.m. until 7.30 right here. The purpose of this group is to provide a consistent message of hope and recovery through God reliance, through the service to others, through the practice and teaching of the 12 steps. We record all speakers so that others may benefit from their message of recovery. If you wish not to be recorded, simply ask. This is an open meeting of, Al of, of Alcoholics Anonymous. The group would like to welcome everyone, especially newcomers. Is there anyone new or from out of town that would like to introduce themselves with their first name? All right. Are, are there any announcements from the floor for the good of AA? Wait, was that? No, oh, hello. Can I make the yes, please. Thank you very much. And this coming Monday uh, in Quaker Town, the Feet First Speaker Group is having their 13th uh, year anniversary. That's at 8 o'clock. It's at the Mennonite Church on Allentown Road. Uh, there'll be cake and ice cream after the meeting, an hour-long speaker. If you are interested in that, come see me during the, uh, after the meeting and give you directions, whatever you need. Um, we have meeting lists and big books on easy terms. Please see myself or any home group member after the meeting. If you cannot afford a big book, the Conscious Contact Fee Group will give you one at no charge. Anyone willing to make donations for CDs, I'm sorry, purchase, or donations for the purchase of Big Book and CDs to help those who can't afford them can put donations in the jar on the table marked Big Book and CD donations. If you'd like a CD of any speaker, past or present, please see myself or any home group member or Ron. Uh, they're available free of charge. And with that, we're going to have Scotty come up and read the AA preamble. My name is Scott and Alcohol. Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self supporting through our own contributions. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution, it does not wish to engage in any controversy, it neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Dave, alcoholic. The AA 12 Steps of Recovery. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Six, were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Seven, humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. Eight, made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. 
Nine, made direct amends to such people wherever possible except to do so would injure them or others. Ten, continued to take personal inventory and when we were wrong promptly admitted it. Eleven, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. And twelve, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we tried to carry them this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Now Nick will come back up and finish it off. We have a seventh tradition which states any, every AA group ought to be fully self-supporting declining outside contributions. At this time, we would like to pass the baskets. We have no dues or fees, but we do have expenses. This group provides many services. Your donations cover rent, big books, CDs, events, and workshops. Also, like to uh, thank again um, for their tireless effort with the food, um, Annette and Brett for the sliders and the hot dogs uh, week by week. They come and bring that food. And also, uh, in the back, there is a flyer for the uh, anniversary meeting here. Uh, please take them to your home groups, pass them out, spread the, uh, spread the love. So if we get a round of applause for Annette and Brett for the food. Thank you. Thank you, Dustin. Once again, there is absolutely no smoking on church property. Please take a moment to silence all cell phones and limit movement during the meeting to avoid distractions, which leads me to our speaker, a great friend of the Conscious Contact Speaker Group, comes to us on loan from the 79th Street Workshop Group from Manhattan, New York, uh, Alan S. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Alan. I'm an alcoholic. You know, so the 79th Street Workshop is a place I go to see if I can be of any service. Also identify with the problems that I come up with in my head during the day and to do a lot of service in the rooms. But I always look around to see if there's anybody who might need some help because essentially I need a vacation from myself every few hours, if not every few minutes. And that's really what this is all about. And I'll explain more about that when we get into the seventh step and how I realized that my biggest problem was I thought about myself too much. You know, it's great to be here. My other home group, I have two home groups. I've been going to both of them for almost 29 years. My other group is Friday Men's Step that meets once a week. It's a rotating step meeting. And without that meeting, I probably wouldn't understand the steps today, which I'll explain a little bit how I understand the steps today. And it's my own understanding. And when I do them, not just talk about them, my life gets better. Okay, I can analyze them, I can brag about them, I can tell you how to do them, but if I'm not doing them, I'm in big trouble. So I'll give you a little bit of my background. I was born in Brooklyn, New York. I was born to two nice people. They weren't great parents, but they were probably better than a lot of other people's parents, but they were great people. And some, one of the things that I gained from the being in, in AA is that I came to see that I should have listened to them and been more like them. They were service oriented. My mother was a politician. She ran PTAs, presidents of PTAs. The Jewish uh, philanthropies on East 57th Street, she was president of for 10 years. She built parks, she built libraries. So she was very active in helping out. And one of the things that I learned uh, before I came into AA from an aunt of mine was that if she was born 20 years later, she probably wouldn't have had kids because in the 40s and 50s, you had kids. I was born in the mid 40s, so that's when you had kids. And she really didn't want to have kids. You know, she didn't have the patience for it. So anyway, I was leaving for kindergarten. My father was leaving me off in kindergarten. I was five years old, five and a half years old. And uh, he was leaving the room, and he wasn't taking me with him. And I said, where are you going? He goes, I'm going to work. And I said, well, I guess I'm going to work with you. And he said, no, you're staying here. And that was the beginning of my alcoholism. You see, I was used to sitting in front of a TV screen, like a 14-inch, 16-inch TV screen, black and white, watching Tex Ritter on his horse. I would be on my piano bench, which was my mother's piano bench, but I didn't call it a piano bench. It was my horse. So the only problem I had was my mother would be screaming from the other room, stop kicking the furniture. And I said, I'm not. I would have a cowboy uniform on, I would have a bolo tie, a gun, a rifle, spurs on my, uh, on my shoes, on my boots, or little boots I would have, and I was looking good. If you saw pictures of me after kindergarten, I had like black eyes, I didn't look like a happy kid anymore because the fun was over. So my worst problem again was, 
they took me out of my isolation. In those days, you didn't have play dates, so I didn't know what little kids even looked like. I knew what adults looked like. I had a sister who was 16 months older, but I really don't remember interacting within the house. My brother was about seven and a half years older. Uh, that's a whole different story because the, I'll talk more about that in the ninth step. Um, that was a, a wonderful thing that came about only because of this program. Otherwise, I would have been stuck in a very bad place to this day, you know, with resentments, okay? So um, at the age of uh, six, I'm in kindergarten. And then I'm traveling through the grammar school years. No booze. Got the problem. I'm already an addict, not hooked on anything. Of course, we know that the alcohol is only a symptom of the disease. So I was only waiting to get the alcohol. So I already had the disease, which I had to deal with at 43 when I walked into AA with the same feeling I had without the drugs and without the alcohol that I had when I walked into kindergarten and, and all those years of grammar school. So at the age of 13, I was five foot two, I got bar mitzvahed. At the age of 14, I was six foot two, sneaking out of the house, about the same height I am now, and going around the corner to, to hang out with some Irish and Italian fellows with tattoos and um, drink. And I didn't like the drink. See, I was used to having ice cream with walnuts on it. I would tell my father, when you bring it home, tell, make sure that the guy puts the syrup from the bottom of the walnuts on top of the ice cream. Make sure he puts the cherry on. And here I am drinking a seven and seven at the age of 14. And it tasted terrible. And I don't remember the first time I got high. I got a, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about my drug story. I found out they were smoking pot. I thought that was the craziest thing I've ever heard. I was smoking pot within a month. Then I found out that they were also talking that they were selling pot so they can get heroin. I was using intravenous by the time I was 16. Now, I want to just give one more part of my, my drug story to show you what a stupid alcoholic I am. And I really believe I was a bit on the stupid side as an alcoholic. I started using a thing called speed, methadrine, okay, crystal meth. I thought I was a drug addict. Every time I used the crystal meth, I would buy, before I would use it, I would go out and buy six quarts of Dewey's scotch. <laughs> Why? Because I would have to drink a half a bottle any time I wanted to get to work. By this time, I was 18, living out of the house. I, lived, I left home when I was almost 18. I was, well, almost 17. I got a job in the back office at Wall, at, uh, on Wall Street. I was a trader at the age of 18, I was making a lot of money, and in order to get to work, which I had to get to work because I certainly don't want to move back home with my parents in Brooklyn, that was my worst horror, not because of them, but because I needed the freedom to get high, so I would get in my car with that booze. When I would drink that booze, coming from a total paranoia state, thinking people were staring at me even though I'm alone in the house, looking through the blinds, looking over my shoulder, riding around on a motorcycle in fourth gear at eight miles an hour, you know, with the clutch, clutching, because I'm, I, I felt paranoid with all the noise, you know, and I would be going through hooker neighborhoods because I was also very lustful, you know. I couldn't do anything because the drug was driving me nuts, but the fact of the matter is, this is how I was living, I took that half a bottle of booze, within 12, 15 seconds down the hatch, my eyes would close a little bit, that warm feeling would come down my gullet, the paranoia would leave, and here I am driving down the FDR Drive in a brand new car to Wall Street from 66th Street and 1st Avenue in Manhattan where I live, and everything was fine. You see why I say I'm a stupid alcoholic? Because when I came into AA and you guys told me that you would take some cocaine so you would be able to drink more and not get sloppy, I thought I was a drug addict and that I should use the drink. I should have just taken a little speed and enjoyed the drink, which I really enjoyed the drink. So I'll give you a little more of my alcoholic story in a second. At the age of 25, I bottomed out on drugs. I got depressed. I felt like killing myself. I wound up in therapy. I'll tell you the two things I learned in therapy, and I'll tell you a little bit about the therapist. I loved the therapist. He was a great guy, but he killed himself. He killed himself three or four years after I met him, not because of me, but he killed himself. Now, why? Because he was an alcoholic. And the two things I learned from him and the reasons I believe he killed himself is because he was an alcoholic and he taught me how to hate my parents and he hated his parents. And one day he just couldn't deal with it any longer and he wound up putting uh, a tube to the exhaust of his 
car down in Florida, he moved down to Florida for a couple of weeks, couple of weeks down there, started the engine, put the tube to his mouth. I love this guy, but he killed himself. He killed himself because of the disease of alcoholism, and that's where I was headed. So what did I do between the ages of 25 and 43? I drank. <laughs> I drank, but I was an ex-addict, so I was proud of it. And people would say, you're the strongest guy I ever met. You see, when I gave up heroin and I gave up speed and intravenous drugs, I also gave up cigarettes within the same couple of days. And people would say, you can't do that. And I said, no, I don't like cigarette smoking. I never had the urge to smoke again. So these stories compiled when I would tell people this, that I'm this ex-drug addict, ex-smoker, and they would say, you're the strongest guy I ever met. I lived on that. You know, with a badge, ex-drug addict badge, you know, that was my pride and joy, okay? But meanwhile, I was walking around for, uh, I was now a regional sales manager for a big corporation. I'm walking around worrying every day. Money's coming in. I got a girl living with me for like nine years. She lived with me. I cheated on her every day. I kept an apartment that I, she thought we were moving. We moved, but I kept the other apartment because I wasn't giving up that life. That lasted, that apartment lasted seven years. This is the way I acted. This is the way I lived. She knew everything about it, she told me in the end, but she didn't say anything. She said, I allowed you to be a baby. That's correct. When I came into the program of AA, my worst problem was I felt like a kid. I was 43 years old. I had all the things I ever needed. I was pretty much looking fairly good. I was a good athlete still. And yet, I felt like a little child. I felt like I needed somebody to take care of me. I felt like I needed to act like somebody else because I wasn't good enough myself. And I certainly was not acting like an adult. I did not care about anybody in my life. And everything that I ever did had a string attached to it. I would tell you that I was so loving and so great and so this. But you ask the people who are around me, and they would say you know, that I was angry at them because I didn't give it back within about three or four seconds. You know, one of my statements is, if I call you my best friend, leave town, because you're going to have a problem. You'll have somebody who's a little pissed off with you in the first minute, and then very angry and probably never going to talk to you again within a couple of days, because you can't keep up with my needs. And that'll be when I start talking about the second step. So I drank for the 18 years. I wound up in a program called Al-Anon, because I had alcoholic partners in a uh, photography business, uh, in a postcard business, and they were driving me crazy, calling me at 3 in the morning, very stoned, and telling me all these plans. And by 10 o'clock, when I would get up about 8, 9, I'd call them at 10. They'd say, oh, that's not going to happen for a while. And the business is making money, and it's going out of business. And a friend of mine said, why don't you come into uh, Al-Anon? I had no idea what she was talking about. I went to Al-Anon, walked into the room, sat down to a, next to a girl who was, uh, uh, she had a beautiful Florida tan. So happens I had a beautiful Florida tan. She became my girlfriend for the next four months. That went into four relationships in a matter of 16 months. That was my life in Al-Anon. The last one brought me to my knees. I couldn't deal with it. I was going to ACOA meetings, adult children of alcoholic meetings, to try to figure out exactly what it was that these girls were doing that I couldn't control. How come I couldn't get them to understand what the, the way they should live? I See, I used to keep people up all night. Now we're talking a little bit about the third step now. Controlling others, directing the show. I would keep people up to all hours of the night, explaining how they should live. Don't work so hard. Come to the park. Of course, come to the park because I'm not doing anything during the day because I don't have to work so hard because I found a way around that. So quit your job and hang out with me because I'm a lonely guy. And if they ever did that, I would tell them, you know, you're giving me too hard of a time. You need too much. So I couldn't win. They couldn't win. So essentially what I came down to, to understanding, I didn't know how to run my life. Went into a therapist, Dick. I became Dick's sponsor after two years. He called me up, and now this is an aside, or an upfront. I got a call from Dick. He was a great therapist. He would say things to me like, is it okay to feel that way? I thought that was great. We weren't analyzing, and I started learning that it's okay to feel a certain way, and he would say, and not go into action. Well, that sounds familiar. That sort of sounds like step three, step ten. You know, don't go into action, but deal with your feeling and not even beat yourself up over it. Love yourself. You're okay the way you are. Feelings aren't facts, but the fact is you have the feeling. So I went into therapy. 
First meeting, I talk to him for 40, 45 minutes. I'm walking out of the office. I figure I'm, I'll speak to him again sometime. He said, listen, call me whenever you want. See me here next week. And by the way, do you go to AA? I said, why would you ask such a question? And he said, just asking. I, his, his, uh, he was on the west side. I had to go all the way to the east side. I hopped a cab. I probably went into a cab. I was desperate. And I went to the 79th Street workshop. I did not like AA. I wasn't on the top rung. I'll give you a little story. I went into a meeting after a couple of months. There were two guys. The fellow's name was Marshall. Another one was John. The minute I walked in the room, never saw this meeting before, never was there, never saw these two guys before, and they're talking to each other. As soon as I see they're talking to each other, I'm left out. Now they're talking about, and I'm listening in, they're talking exactly like this. They got bananas. He's going to put that in his oatmeal, and the other guy got like cranberries. He's going to put that in his oatmeal. I said, well, I'll go home. I called my sponsor. I said, I don't fit in. He says, well, what do you mean? I said, these two guys, they go to breakfast. They got their oatmeal they're going to get. They got their cranberries. They got their bananas. I don't fit in. He goes, just look up and pray when you go to that room. Leave these two guys alone. I go back. I start praying. A couple of weeks or a couple of days go by, probably more like a couple of weeks. Marshall gives me a thumbs up. I go home, call my sponsor. I said, I think I'm in. He says, in where? And I said, well, Marshall gave me a thumbs up. He said, well, you know, just keep praying, keep praying. I go back about two or three days later. John comes up to me with this woeful look on his face. And he says to me, how come you don't come to eat breakfast with us? Like I'm rejecting him. And I said, oh, man, I'll come tomorrow. I'll be, you know, we'll, we'll eat together, all of us. The next day, I went, oh, I go home, I call my sponsor, I say, I'm in. What do you mean? I said, well, I'm going to breakfast with these two guys. These guys, you know, huh? this is the in crowd. I didn't last 20 seconds at that breakfast. I decided I don't even like these guys, you know? They weren't bad guys, but I didn't like the conversation. I'm a ball player. I wanted to go running, go play some ball, go do some work, do something. I didn't want to sit in a restaurant for a half an hour in the morning. I still don't like doing that so much. So I left, and I understood how crazy I am. You see, I want what I can't have, and I want it now. So I'm sitting in AA, and I would look out a stained glass window into a shaftway. The window sometimes is open, but you're still looking at a brick wall. And I would say, what would I be doing if I wasn't in AA, if I wasn't sitting here right now? So I went over my first step, and I said, well, you tried everything. I had all the different shapes and sizes of cars. I had all the different types of ways of dressing. I had a lot of different people and women in my life. They said, you tried everything. That's what the bottom is for me. I tried everything and my life was unmanageable. I could not run my own life. I could not get it to where I was comfortable and calm. You know, there was a point somewhere about two or three years before I came in the program and a girl was coming over and I was dancing in the house, you know, like she's coming over, I'm excited. I don't even think I was drinking. And I knew that I was nuts. And I said, you're not a happy guy, Alan. And that thought went through in one, in one part of my brain and out the other part of my brain. And it only to, came to understand that when I came into the program of AA, that I wasn't really happy. That all the fantasies and all the dreams that I make up fueled sometimes by, fuel, by booze. You see, I didn't make as much trouble when I was drinking as when I wasn't. When I was irritable is when I made most of my problems. If I woke up, I wasn't high, and I was lonely or desperate, or you owed me money, I was on top of you, and that's where I went, and people would start saying, leave me alone. I was wondering a lot why people weren't calling me back, girls weren't calling me back. You know, I'll tell you a little bit about that in my amends, what I found out. You know, you know going into, um, into the program of AA, the best thing that ever happened to me, you know, I saw that my heart was closed off. It wasn't closed off to what I wanted and what I needed. It was closed off to loving you and needing to be nice to you and being kind to you. Totally closed off. And I believe that's where sobriety is. Sobriety is really how much I'm loving you. It's not really how much you're loving me. You know, I can love you any time I want. The amount of love you give me will never be enough. It will never, ever be enough. I appreciate it and I get a lot of love. But if I'm living on that, I'll be at your doorstep every, every 10 minutes or calling you and saying, could you repeat that? Could you repeat that you love me? 
You know, I'll tell you a little experience later on that I just came up with just the other day, just a couple of days ago that pertains to that, if I don't forget to tell you, but I'll try. Okay? So, um, you know, I'm sitting in the rooms of AA and I'm starting to do service. There was a fellow, he's never too soon to, to do service. I met a guy when I had 16 years, I was walking up the block, he stopped me, he goes, you will not remember me, but when I came back, he came back from a slip, he spent a lot of time in rehab, maybe three, four years in rehab, and he said, I came down to the 7.15 a.m. meeting at the workshop, and I still, and he takes his, my, my card out of his wallet. You gave me this, and he says, I have three or four more of these in my desk. He says, I never called you, but you came up to me every day, that I came in that room, and every day you came up and you, as if you never met me, and you gave me your card again. So I said, well, I, he probably has like three, four years, something like that. He had a month less than me. One month, I was helping him. It's never too soon to help another alcoholic. In fact, if you have less time, people can identify like that with that much more than if you have 30 years and they come in and they, only, they can't get a day together, 30 years, maybe you can talk to somebody with eight days, nine days, 20 days, maybe 90 days. But you know, we can help each other. Anybody can help anybody. And when you start helping, you're free of yourself. You're done with yourself. You're not sitting around wondering why you're not getting what you want. You know, the first step says, I'm happy about being powerless. It does not say that. I'm only kidding. <laughs> Nobody's happy about being powerless. You see, alcoholics want to be happy. I don't want to be happy. I want to be serene. I want to be comfortable with myself. I want to be accepting of the fact that I'm powerless over what's going on around me and come to terms with my own needs and my own wants and my own frustrations and leave you alone instead of trying to get the power over you. You know, my life only gets unmanageable and it turns into hell when I try to get power over something that's not, that I have no uh, power over. I have power over how I treat people. I have power over whether I want to go to the gym. You know, I get up first thing in the morning, I put on a tape. I've heard these tapes over and over hundreds of times. So the first thought is, the alcoholic thought is, why are you putting it on? You've heard it a hundred times already. The second I hear the guy's voice, I don't even have to hear, you know, what he's going about to say. I'm all better. You see, I'm out of my head. I'm listening to something outside of me instead of listening to myself. My next question is, the phone's going to ring any minute now. Plus, you're going to get in the elevator and go downstairs. I'm not working that much anymore. So I go to the gym. My question is, how are you going to be when you get on the phone? You're going to be crabby? You're going to be irritable? You're going to start taking their inventory and being nasty about it? How are you going to be when you get to the gym? You're going to see two people talking like when, they were, when you were in the, your first day at that meeting, when the Marshall and John, you're going to treat, go back to the gym and see if you can butt into their conversations and see if you can get them to listen to you and tell you how great you are? Can't do that. Get in the elevator, you're going to be kind and polite. You're going to like wish that, you know, wish somebody a good day and say hello to somebody. And that's what I, how I start my day. It don't matter. It doesn't say anywhere in these steps that if you're feeling lousy, you can treat people lousy. It doesn't say if you're feeling lousy, you can go drink again. It doesn't say if you're feeling lousy that you can run yourself off of a, uh, run your car off of a highway into another car. All it says is, if you're feeling lousy, we'll teach you how to live with feeling lousy. We all feel lousy at times. We all get physical things, we all get emotional things, we have breakups, we get new relationships that cause a lot of anxiety. You know, this is part of living. You know, who wants to live with anxiety? Certainly not an alcoholic. So, happy about being powerless? The answer to that question is no. The reality is the acceptance of powerlessness. Not just over the alcohol, over the whole entire thing. You know, you can sit home and try to get the stock market to go up by worrying about it, it will not go up. If you think it went up because you were worrying about it, you're wrong. You know, it's just not gonna happen. If you think you could sit there and wait for a letter to come and worry about it and the mailman comes and yes, if you think hard enough, You'll will that check into the mail. It won't happen, that's not gonna happen. But I've done that, and I've spent hours in my lifetime thinking, thinking, and more thinking where smoke was coming out of my ears, where I'll be able to get this, just my thinking, the God, or, well, I never thought of God, so I might, might as well not talk about God. Never thought about God in my life. I used to think about the devil taking my life, but I never thought about God. I used to make deals with the devil 
give me another five years. I don't even know why I asked for five years. Life wasn't that good. Should have only asked for a few weeks. Get out of this hell that I was living in. You know, but I didn't know how hellish it was until I came into the program of AA. And as I get more into it, the more I understand the damage that I did, and the more I understand what hell it really was. To sit around so stuck in my head, as they say, furnishing a rut all day long, you know, um, driving myself crazy and believing it. And people telling me, what are you so worried about? And I was worried. And the only thing that fixed that, well, by the way, when I got off of drugs, I was running 100 miles a week within two months. Talk about drugs, you know? A couple of years ago, I was playing tennis. I was playing tennis 20 hours a week for a couple of weeks. I got a thing called Morton's Neuroma. Still an addict. You see, if, if it's not addictive, I really don't like it, okay? I like addiction. But I learned how to control it somewhat, so I don't play 20 hours of tennis. I don't run 100 mile weeks anymore. And I try to like do a little moderation in everything I do. That's the hard part in life, to sort of like control my life to get it where it's right, to eat right. You know, not overeat, not undereat, to sleep right. You know, don't under sleep, don't overeat. You know, to have relationships with people where it's a give and take. Maybe start off by giving instead of waiting for somebody to come along and feed you something. This way you'll be nice to them. You know, the second step said, if I get another girlfriend, I'll be restored to sanity. That didn't happen. You know, give me some more money, I'll be restored to sanity. See, I became a workaholic in AA. In my third or fourth year, I became a workaholic where one day I'm walking after about a year and a half of, I was, I'm a photographer, and I was not only addicted to, to, to the work, and the money. I was addicted to the affirmations from my editors to tell me how great I was, how great my photography was, and I was up at the stock agency constantly. I mean, no, none of the photographers went up there. I went up three, four times a week, try to manipulate the sales department, manipulate the editorial department, the catalog department, and I was doing a pretty good job of doing it. They liked having me there. They were buying into the fact that my photography was good and I was starting to make more money and more money, and I was up there to get the affirmation, boy, Alan, you are fantastic. And every once in a while I would say, am I bugging people here? And they said, no, nah, you're good for business, you know? But the fact was, one day I stopped on the corner of Fifth Avenue uh, and the 20th Street, and I said, you're going to die. I said that to myself. And it was scary. It was a scary moment in my life because I was addicted again. You see, I was addicted to work and affirmations. I was addicted to money, you know? And I wasn't happy. I was getting into new cars. And the minute I, before I would start the engine, I would say, I wonder if I'm going to be able to afford another one in three years. You see, I didn't even start enjoying this one. I'm worried about three years from now, you know? The next check, get one check. I'm high for about 20 minutes. I'm wondering if the next check will be good. You see a big ego. Fill the hole, fill the hole, fill the hole. Came to believe, came to believe, came to believe. I had to start eliminating. So I came up with a phrase for myself that it was elimination to illumination. I had to stop making people, pay people, places, and things. But it wasn't like I made them, it took away them from being my higher power. I do it constantly. Have to keep turning my life and will over to somebody other than you. And, somebody, and something other than money. And something other than even anything for that matter. I'll talk more about that in the seventh step. The third step said that I bombarded my problems with self-will. It also talks about directing the show. It talks about a worker among workers. Directing the show is not a worker among workers. Directing the show means that you're in charge. If you don't get what you want, you will be kicking and screaming. You will be a victim. And you'll probably have a ton of self-pity. And that means you'll be depressed. And if you just come to accept that you're just one of the universe, one of the many people, and you start listening, which I did when I first came in, and I said, wow, other people have problems. I didn't know that in Al-Anon. The four girls I went out with, had, they had major problems. They came from alcoholic families. They would read books in closet with flashlights. They were like living in dog uh, feces because the parents weren't cleaning it up because they were alcoholics. They didn't go to school because they didn't have the money. You know, they, they, the parents didn't give them any way of getting to school. That's where they were coming from. Did I care? No, just love me. Let me take care of you. I wasn't looking to take care of you. I was looking to like be connected to somebody. You know, big ego, maybe get some sex, maybe feel like I'm connected. Live in the illusion that I have somebody. So I was making these women into my higher power. They were having a struggle themselves. Isn't everybody having a struggle? Everybody has a struggle. 
You know, the other day, I'll tell you this now. The other day I was sitting in the house. I'm having an anxiety. Okay? I'm in a relationship. I'm having an anxiety. It's a new relationship. Just two days ago this happened. And I'm saying, you know, what if you start thinking about, like, how you can make her life better? Give her a good day, like today. That's today. Give her, that's my friend here. Give her a good day today, tomorrow. And the anxiety went away. It went totally away. As soon as I stopped worrying, and it does, it's not obvious that I'm worrying about myself. It's just happening that I am, because it proves out that as soon as I start thinking of you, I see that that's what the problem was. You know, Bill wrote in uh, 1958, in his emotional sobriety piece for the grapevine, that his biggest problem was that he was seeking perfect romance and perfect security. He came to see that he had adolescent urges that weren't appropriate at the age of 57, that were only appropriate to the age of 13 and 14. And he had 25 years in the program, he was on a control trip, and he said, I I wonder why he was going into a depression and he says, I wonder why these steps are not working for me. And then he came across something. It's a miracle. He came across it since, what a miracle. He put it in the book in the 11th step, the St. Francis prayer. All of a sudden it dawns on him, maybe if he worked the St. Francis prayer. Maybe if he started helping others for fun and for free. No strings attached. I have a fellow named Vince. I told him about strings because he kept complaining about his wife and what he did for the family. And I said, yeah, but did you have any strings attached? That's a big deal for me, that phrase. Strings attached, that means I'm going to have a resentment any minute now because I'm not going to get it back. Because you're not giving it to me the way I want. It won't be enough anyway. So they're in the, he sends me every few, every holiday for sure. Alan, it's Vince, no strings attached, I'm doing well. <laughs> he reminds me to keep these strings from, it's an automatic for an alcoholic to all of a sudden become selfish and self-seeking. Third step in the big book, the root of the problem, selfish, self-seeking, selfishness, there's the answer. I would read that every day for the first four or five months in the big book, I would be sitting on the toilet reading it, I would be okay, all better for 10 minutes. And then this, the insanity would start rising again. And all of a sudden, I'm wondering about Alan again and what I need and what I'm going to get and who I'm going to call to start pushing around. You know, the fourth step said I better go learn to know, what, to know myself. Well, I didn't have to, like, look too far. I was selfish and self-seeking. That's it. Every one of my, the people I, worked, I talked about, it was all about me it's selfish and self-seeking and what they did to me and why it hurt me and why I was angry at them. That's including the last four girls I went out and went an Allen on. That was including my brother. That was including everybody. I did not know whether or not you had a problem. I did not care about you and your problem. I was self-centered, as they say, to the extreme. Not self-centered. We're all self-centered. To the extreme. We're not looking for perfectionism. We're looking for some sort of moderation where you count... I count, and we have a true partnership with another human being, which means I'll listen to you, you'll listen to me, and maybe we can make a relationship. Maybe we can get going here. Maybe I can actually care about somebody and forget about myself. You know, the fifth step, <laughs> it says the exact nature of my wrongs. It doesn't say every little thing you ever did. They were all the same. Everything I did was selfish and self-seeking. There was the exact nature of my wrongs. <coughs> The seven deadly sins, they're all in there. Was I, was I lustful? Yeah. Was I greedy? Yeah. Was I angry? 100%. All of those things, when I see them pop up today, I get into six. What are you going to do? What's the consequences of acting out the greed? People are going to run away. Well, maybe I'll get locked up for robbing a bank. What about lust? Maybe my girlfriend will leave me when she finds out I'm cheating on her. Maybe I'll wind up with a disease because I can't control my actions and I don't even, you know, I won't use protection because I'm so lustful. I mean, a lot of diseases happen because people are not thinking with the uh, right head, you know? <laughs> this is a powerful, very powerful disease. You know, seven step tells me I cannot fix myself. 
Either I believe there's a power greater than me, I cannot get rid of the defect. I can't sit there and will, will away, self-will away the defect of character. How I know God is in my life when I start doing his will. His will is love, kindness, justice for other people. And to be honest and truthful, that's his will. This way you're not walking around wondering when they're going to catch you in a lie. You're not figuring out maybe the cops are coming today or maybe your girlfriend's going to call you any minute now and break it off. Because you're not dishonest, you can live again. <coughs> because you're giving, people are actually calling your house. This is the most amazing thing i ever seen. My phone don't stop ringing. People are calling me and I enjoy talking to them. And I'm a tough sponsor, so I'm a little tough sometimes. But I believe that's okay, because if you want to be tough on somebody, get some sponsees, and then you can be a little tough on them. Maybe be a little pushy, and maybe try to do direct them in the right direction. You know, the, so the seventh step, when I got to the seventh step, essentially I got there in the 15th or 16th year. I picked a new sponsor. I had hives all over my body. I was in a lot of depression. It was just starting. It lasted a year and a half. I called up Tom, my sponsor today. And I said to him, be my sponsor. He said, how many guys are you sponsoring? I said, about five or six, maybe seven, I'm not sure. He said, you're in good shape, call me later. I understood that message. He said, as long as you're helping others, that's the only way you're going to get through this. Well, what I found out when he said to me, by the way, you're only starting seven now. Don't feel bad. Some people, most people start seven when they're in their 20th year, when they come to recognize what I came to recognize that year. And what I came to recognize that year was, I think about myself too much. You see, I was getting in front of the mirror every 20 minutes to see where the hives were going. It was a long haul, except when people were calling me and asking me for help, except when I went to work or I went to the uh, AA meetings. And I didn't cry at the AA meetings, and most people did not know what I was going through. Just a few friends, maybe six or seven people, that I would like sort of even cry to because it was a painful moment. But I came to the AA meetings to get rid of myself to get away from myself. Wow, what a powerful thing. It's a very, very powerful thing. So that's what I found out, thinking about myself too much. You know, step eight. Step eight is a very important step. It's between seven and nine for good reason. People think it's a segue into nine. It's really a segue back into seven. What are my motives? Are my defects of character still ruling my life where I'm going into that step nine, uh, still selfish and still self-seeking in whatever way it is. It could be you're lonely, it could be you're lustful, it could be you want money from this person, and you want it back because you know, your, your ego is at stake and you've got to like, prove that you can get it back. I've got to get back to seven and make sure my defects of character are toned down. Again, it's progress, not perfection. It's not 100%. It doesn't mean, oh, I see where there's a little bit of a problem. I feel a little greedy, so I can't make the amends. No. The fact of the matter is, it's a living amends. I'll give you a little story about, about Jeremy. Jeremy was a fellow. I was speaking at a meeting. He raised his hand, and he said that he was sitting with his mother. He had five years in the program. His mother said, you know, your father and I finally believe that you will not hurt us anymore. And Jeremy said, what are you talking about? I told you I was in AA five years ago. She said, yes, but do you notice that I'm not carrying my pocketbook around while you're in the house? I've carried it around for five years because I was afraid you were going to rob it, in other words. It took him five years to trust him. You see, this is not about forgiveness. This is about a long haul of other people finally coming to see. If you don't just come into AA, raise your hand when you get out in the street and say, I got one day in AA, forgive me, trust me, Let, give me your kids, I'll babysit them. You know? <laughs> You'll notice that most people will not let you near their nephew for maybe two or three or four years after you come off a big run. They don't want to trust you. They won't even let you in the house when they're there. They don't even want anything to do with you. Trust takes a long time before you really connect by the, in the heart that the person isn't flinching every time. You know, if you, you, you think about the analogy of a guy who's hitting his wife every day and she finally comes to forgive him because he went to therapy and this and that. But every time he lifts his hand to get a glyph, she flinches. Why? Because that's her natural habit is not to trust them. That's what we did to people. That's what we did. It takes a long, long time to get trust. Forgiveness? So Jeremy's mother said, yeah, I'm your mother, so I forgave you because I love you. 
but I still carried my pocketbook around. My mother and father, when I got into the second year, first month of the second year, I'm sitting in, this, in my uh, step meeting on Friday night. The meeting went over time, uh, uh, was under time, I mean, so he was speaking a little bit extra. And I saw, all of a sudden, I'm crying. Finally dawned on me. Uh, from the ages of 14, those are the worst years for my parents. From the ages of 14, I left home at 16. At 25, I finally got off of drugs. They worried about whether I was going to die. These are good people. They stayed up all the time. My sister came over by fluke that day, and I mentioned that to them. And I wrote a little letter to my parents who were not alive anymore. My only regret is that I wasn't able to give my parents a better life. Today, I would probably do that. That's the only regret. I don't have a. I believe they're beaming down on me. I believe they're proud of me today. I believe they like who I am today. But I wish they were here so I can do that and I can, uh, you know. So um, I forget where I was. Anyway, you know, she said that's correct. They were up all the time worrying. There was my amends. That was the beginning of me understanding. Nobody did anything to me. I did it to them. If you did it to your parents, you did it to everybody else around you. People worried, you hurt them, you know, that's the way I see my life. I created havoc everywhere I went. There was a resentment with everybody, okay? So now I get into the 10th step. 10th step, I read that within a couple of weeks of coming in a program and I understood the whole entire program. If you don't understand the program by reading that step, you probably haven't hit bottom. The problem really is me. So it's me and God. And then I have sponsors and a couple of other old timers and friends that I can speak to about it. But it really is between me and God. That I have to be able to restrain myself, self-restraint. I got to be able to keep my mouth shut even though I have an urge to I tell you really where it's at. I got to keep my thing, you know, my things in order and not push them off on you. You are not responsible for my life. I am responsible for my life, and I'll be honest with you, I'm responsible for your life. Because they say that it's not my business what, you, what other people think about me. Yes, it is. If I am hurting you, it's my business what you think about me. So I try not to hurt people. And every once in a while I might, so I can promptly admit it. But do I want to work the 10th step before or after? Do I want to keep apologizing? Especially if the person I'm apologizing to is doing things I didn't like. So here I am apologizing. It's like, you know, in basketball, you get fouled, but you foul the guy back. The referee sees you foul the guy back. And you say, but he hit me first. I didn't see that. I saw you. I was always the one that fouled back. A lot of the times I didn't start it. I was the guy who fouled back. I was the one, if the police had to come to the house, they were locking me up. You've seen this before. You know, the 11th step talks about prayer and meditation. It also brings up the St. Francis prayer. I really believe that that was uh, the whole deal is to understand. It says prayer, meditation, and self-examination. It's the, the, the triangle. It's the three-legged chair, stable, to become stable within myself, to know who I am, to see what's ticking. People say, I couldn't sit still. I was nervous. I see you. That's, what, that's your inventory. You're nervous. I couldn't sit still. I'm lustful. Yeah, there's your inventory. It's your inventory. You can't say, well, when that goes away, then I'll sit still. It'll never go away. You come to accept it. You come to terms. I came to terms with rage sometime in the, and I won't tell you the story because it doesn't matter. Sometime in my fourth year, I sat down on the couch in rage. I was a rage, I was a rageaholic. I never felt rage again. I never ever yelled loudly after that. That's 25 years ago. I sat down and I came to terms with my rage. I don't know how that was, it was the biggest gift. 12 step means spiritual awakening. There are other people in the world. There's the spiritual awakening. Other people in the world. It's not you, Alan, only. A request instead of a demand, a true partnership with another human being. You know, humble yourself. Understand you're only another person. You're not bigger, you're not worse, you're just part of the deal. In AA, this is only a microcosm of what goes on. It's everywhere I go, so it's a practice of the principles in all my affairs. Not just in AA to prove to everybody what a great AA guy you are. I walk through the streets, I have people in the building. Well, a girl was walking out of the gym maybe three, four years ago. She goes to the 79th Street workshop. 
she yells to me across the street. <coughs> Excuse me one second. See, I'm able to pause without worrying what you're thinking about me. That's not a bad deal, <laughs> you know? She yells at me, I go talk to her, and she says, you know, this is like the 79th Street workshop to you, the gym. I said, what do you mean? She says, everybody comes over and talks to you. They all yell your name when they come in, and they want to talk to you, I see, about what's going on in their life. That's correct. In the building, it's the same thing. I play with the kids, I play with the older people. I give them a, I go into fairway, I'm talking to the people. I put my arm around them. They deserve a break. You know, they're standing on their feet all day. You know, say hello by their name. Their tag is right there. Hi, Francine, how are you? You know, make them human. Make them feel like the, you know, the, the rest of the world should feel like they're human. You know, not just a, a cash register clerk. It's a very emotional thing. So, you know, the living amends is a very important thing. By the way, the spot check inventory, if you do the inventory at the end of the day, it might be about 12, 15 hours late. You might be in big trouble already. You better keep an eye on yourself all day. You're, you're dealing with a 13-year-old. That's you, a 13-year-old. You've got to keep an eye on it. As if like the kid was walking around in traffic, you had an actual son. You can't let him walk around. You've got to watch him all day. As much of a problem it is, oh man, he drove me nuts, that's right. And you got yourself, and yourself is gonna drive you crazy. But if it acts out, you might lose friends, you might lose money, you might lose your life, you might wind up in jail, you might wind up in a nut house. And if you don't think that's true, give it a shot. You know? I'm gonna talk a little bit about what Joe, Joe, a few things my sponsors told me, Joe Carroll. Joe was a 75-year-old man. I walked up to him one day, tapped him on the shoulder and said, you know, Joe, I had about four years in the program. I'm feeling lustful. Well, he was 75 years old. He had about 50 years of marriage. And in his deep, gruffy Irish voice, he said, nice to know your libido is still working, Alan. And I said, that's it? And he said to me, let's go help another alcoholic. We'll go to the diner. And that was his answer all the time. He did not analyze anything with me. And if I would say to him, is that the third step? He says, I have no idea. <laughs> he didn't know the steps that well. He would tell people, Alan's teaching me the steps. <laughs> I was going through hell in the first couple of weeks of AA, thinking about an audit that somebody was threatening me with, with the IRS. All day long, I was digging a hole, sweating. I was insane. I called my, my sponsor finally gets back to me five to, it was a Friday. I know why, because I was going on a Friday men's step. He calls me and he says, well, uh, I said, I'll meet you at the meeting. It's five to six. He says, no, no, wait, you want to have a good meeting? I said, my life is over. My life is over. There's no good meeting. There's no more good days. I'm in trouble. And he said to me after I explained it to him what was going on, he said, who are you making into your higher power? As soon as he said that, he said, you don't know if they're going to audit you. You don't know when they're going to audit you, and it won't be for years. It's not like you're number one on the list. And if it does, if you get the audit, you won't even know if that's the reason. And I said, well, I'll see you at the meeting. He said, well, wait. I said, no, I'm all better. And I was all better. And this guy was capable of saying things to me that I all of a sudden was better numbers of times. Where one day I said, I'll feel better tomorrow. I hear him laughing on the other end, and he said... You're going to wait till tomorrow? And I hung up on him. Called him back within five minutes. I was walking down Fifth Avenue with my ice skates over my shoulders toward a meeting having a good day. Where I wasn't even able to skate before that. That's why I called him because I was down, depressed, anxious, the whole entire thing. Life was over for me. Life was over. That's why I drank because life was over a lot. I don't have to drink today. You know, I went down to Florida. I drove down in my new car. I'm driving down, the music is blasting, I'm Mick Jagger, I'm, you know, I'm John Travolta, I'm Sly Stallone, you know, the music is blasting, I'm A.J. Foyt, I'm Al, Al Unser, straight through, having a blast, blasting music, eating a little bit, nice, nice trip, speeding, it was beautiful. I get down to my new apartment, which I have never seen, I had built it over the winter, over the, over the summer. I walked in, called my sponsor, said, I'm going to be putting this apartment on the market. What happened was I walked in the house, 
I didn't have to walk in the house. I shut the music off and the engine went off. All the fantasies were gone. I was not Al Unser anymore. I wasn't John Travolta. I wasn't Sly Stallone. I was nobody. I was living in a fantasy. I was stoned on music and driving a fast car. And I walked in the house and I was an empty soul with 15 years in the program, 16 years in the program, an empty soul living in a fantasy, okay, trying to pump myself up, get, trying to get high on life again. And he said to me, what's going on? I said, this is what I'm feeling. And he said, I don't care what you're feeling. And then I said, well, okay, here's what I'm thinking. He said, you already told me what you're thinking. I said, what's left, Tom? He says, what are you doing? Why are you down there? Why did you buy the place? And I went over a whole list of reasons I'm down there. He says, try that out. Call me back in a few days. Get to a meeting. See if you can be of service to somebody else. And he hung up. Now, I never liked it down in Florida, so I eventually sold the places. But that, I didn't live in the hell that I did when I shut the engine off, the music off, and I wound up with nothing. Nothing. You see, I can't get high on the outside. I can't bullshit myself. Excuse the language. I'm sorry. I can't lie to myself and start trying to make myself into something I'm not. i got to come to terms with myself. I have to slow it down, feel what I'm feeling, and come to terms with the fact if it's anxiety, if it's some jealousy, if it's any of the defects of character, i got to talk about it. i got to come to terms. I am a human being, and I'm going to try to be a little bit more spiritual instead of being an animal. I was an animal. Okay? So, uh, Bill. One of my sponsors, he was my spiritual advisor. He gave me books to read. He showed me how to read. He taught me a little bit about meditation. And one day I called, uh, his name was Bob. So one day I called Bob, 9 a.m., and he says, your head's going to blow off one day. I said, it's 9 o'clock in the morning. What does that mean? And he said, how much longer are you going to act as if? And he hung up. I knew not to call them back, because my sponsors never answered. If, if they wanted to tell me something, they would just tell me. They weren't going to say, give me an answer. Go figure it out for yourself. I walked out of the house, and God gave me the answer. What if you find something you like about every person you meet? I looked at a stranger when I said that to myself. What if I find something I like, a, a nugget, one nugget, and you live in that? And I started doing that, and today I can say I have five minutes for anybody in the universe. There is nobody shut out of my life today. If I see that building up, I give it two or three minutes, and then I let go of it. I get off on it for two or three minutes, the old style, and then I let go of it, and I know I'm just going to create a happy, a, a, a unhealthy day with a lot of havoc in it. You know, I'll give you one more thing, and then I'm going to get off. Dur. This is a story that was stolen from me. Somebody else used it as if it was their story. It's my story. I was at a meeting, second or third year in the program. In the middle of the meeting, two old timers I was sitting up, sitting with. The meeting was not on the step. The speaker was not on the step. These two guys get up and say, this guy's not on the step. We're getting out of here. We get out of there. We go to a diner, and we're talking about how lousy the guy was, and this and that, and that and this. The next week I come back to the meeting, there's Dar, a real sweet man. Found out later on he also had a lot of defects of character, but he treated people with respect and love, and they considered him a nice guy. Okay? So I sit down in the room, it's a packed house, I'm sitting right next to Dar. In the middle of the meeting, I get up, guy was not on a step, I go home, I call Dar about 10, 15 minutes after he would be home. He says to me, you're going to be very depressed. I said, that's why I'm calling you. I am depressed. And he goes, well, you know, here's your problem, Alan. You talk a lot about the steps. You're a big mouth with the steps. But you don't work them. I said, what did you do at the meeting? He says, I went where they were. What you did was you had justifiable anger. You know, justifiable anger. You were self-righteous. You thought that you were the king of talking about steps. He wasn't. It would never be good enough for you, Alan. So you have justifiable anger everywhere you go. And he taught me a lesson. Work the steps. Practice the steps. Use them in your life. Stop talking about them. Use them as a tool. You can talk about a hammer all day long. It will not put the nail in the wall. You got to hit it. And you got to hit. And you can't leave the hammer home because you did a, a nail job the day before. You got to bring the hammer in the tool chest to work the next day. Otherwise, the house doesn't get built. Well, put a, a nail in yesterday. That's not good enough. Today's the day. Today's the day. I love you guys. Thanks for listening.
thank Alan one more time. Customary for us to form a line and thank our speakers formally. They come here at their own time and expense just to, to share their message of hope and recovery with us. Next week we have Mary Ann D. coming up from Maryland. Uh, we're going to need a lot of help cleaning up this mess, so uh, there's a lot of people here. If you want to be of service, give us a, a hand, stack up those chairs. Here, this is the alcoholic test. If you pass this, you're not an alcoholic. We've got to lead seven deep, five across on both sides. Five deep, seven across. Anyway, we've got a nice way of closing if you care to join us to see you after the meeting. Don't forget the meeting after the meeting.